welcome uh, again. It's um, been a rainy morning, and uh, uh, but uh, and then snow tomorrow maybe. But um, but welcome to now the fifth one. Uh, now this is on consciousness, but I've actually moved the consciousness stuff on a little bit to the last one. So you'll maybe see why as we move along. Um, if I can unfreeze this thing. Yeah, I always seem to have, oh, here we are. Well, listen, if you've just won a Nobel Prize, this is what it looks like. This is Jennifer Duda. Uh, this is within a minute of being told uh, or less that she won the Nobel Prize this year. So uh, yeah, she looked pretty excited. And uh, that's what it looks like. Now this looks like it has nothing to do with today, uh, but, uh, but this is a sea slug. And it caught my interest because um, uh, Eric Kendell, who did a lot of fundamental work on memory, uh, used a sea slug, not this specific species, but one related to it. And uh, what caught me was that this is in the Science Times or the New York Times. And, um, and that thing down to, the, down to the right, what happened, it, somebody was watching the sea slug. And, and then over minutes, uh, the head separated off and kind of made its, wary, its merry way. Uh, and then over the subsequent uh, six or seven days, grew an entire body. And uh, what happened to the rest of the body that is now um, uh, headless, brainless, is that uh, it managed to uh, stay active for another week or so. Uh, but it, um, but it's, it, it's oh, there's another one. Uh, so uh, it, it's, it, it's an interesting phenomenon, isn't it? I mean, uh, some of us would love to have a new brain and, um, uh, or maybe a new body. But uh, so this sea slug uh, seems to be ahead of us on this one. Oh, now there's that turn. Yeah, let's see. Oh, here we go. Now, I, what I did after last week is I went back over because uh, uh, there have been a few questions um, and I discovered this uh, in putting this series together as well, just how much really good stuff has been done on the brain and what's the focus of that activity been? And so I used it as, a, as the marker, the Nobel Prizes going back to 1936. And of those Nobel Prizes, only one of them, that one in 1981, Roger Sperry, that was a study of uh, the kind of split brain studies, uh, comparing the right hemisphere and the left hemisphere. But all the other studies, if you look at them, uh, that the first one, the O'Keefe and uh, the husband and wife team of the Mosers, uh, that was looking at these GPS neurons in the temporal lobe. But, but most of the other studies are quite basic studies. I have to say in my own judgment, when I look at these studies, I have enormous, if you look down to the 1963 prize, uh, those are three of my uh, heroes in neurophysiology and neuroscience. And uh, the experiments of Huxley, uh, Huxley and Hodgkin on a single squid axon is, uh, is amazing. And even in recent textbooks, the figures come right out of those original papers, even if they've been decorated up with color, that kind of thing. So it, uh, and, and, uh, and there's uh, uh, Eccles, uh, a Rhodes Scholar from Australia, and, um, have who helped me out a few times in my career. So, uh, but uh, I, I really didn't expect this. And, um, but it explained, I think it's explained by the fact that how, how complex the brain is and that basic neuroscientists, uh, it, it's very difficult to study uh, such a complex organ as, as the brain. Um, and I think that's the reason now, we may well see more uh, in, in the near future. We'll see what happens. The, the Nobel Committee is, uh, on the science side at least, is conservative. And they tend to wait and see whether stuff really pans out. 
And uh, you remember Penrose uh, from last year? Well, that was uh, almost 30 years later after the studies. And um, well, here's one uh, I, that the first one I put in the, in the Lake Report was the article several weeks ago on consciousness and unconscious, the unconscious state. Um, uh, well, it, it's pretty obvious that 99.99% of the brain's activity we're not aware of, and thankfully so. Uh, we focus on what's immediate and has our attention. And I remember when I wrote that article, I wrote it thinking about that very thing and realizing that, you know, I was really only aware of the words moving across the page and my hand actually writing it out. And then the occasional car would go by half a block away and my left visual field and I'd pick up the movement or a squirrel fiddling around on, or out on the back, but, but that was it. And, and I remember thinking about that there is a, there is a threshold, and others have commented on this, a threshold for awareness. And, um, and it shifts. It's, it's changing all the time. But there, I'm going to take a more practical focus today, as I did with that first article, because there are structural correlates, structural and functional correlates. And with respect to consciousness, the conscious state, okay, what parts of the brain are absolutely essential that really need to function? And number one is the upper brain stem and the so-called diencephalon, but the thalamus on both sides and the related system called the ascending reticular system. Now, we don't really know much about the system. It consists of, of millions of, of interneurons that uh, with relatively short processes. And uh, heaven knows how they're processing information, but they certainly get a lot of sensory feedback as the sensory systems, the big fiber systems project their messages up to the primary sensory cortex and the same for the visual system. And, uh, and, and sound, they're also dropping off branches to this ascending reticular system. So uh, no surprise, lesions in the high brainstem or lesions that extend widely in both hemispheres are associated with a loss of consciousness. Now, um, but sometimes consciousness is perverted, it's distorted. There may be consciousness, but it's different. It's not, it's not normal. And for, I've already uh, used a couple of these examples, but of course, one was my father who had a parietal um, uh, ischemic stroke and um, in his early seventies on his non-dominant side. And he was unaware of his limbs on the left side, the left side of the face, and also unaware of his, anything in his left visual field. And I'm gonna show you an illustration of that, not from him, but the kind of phenomenon uh, a little bit later. Uh, there are a whole slew of so-called metabolic encephalopathies. Uh, a couple of these I've, I've talked about before, at least last week, Wernicke Korsakoff. Um, and I'm going to, in just a moment, get to concussion. And there is a strike in the article that's coming up this week and the, and the uh, Lake Report uh, focuses on Eric Brown, the most uh, decorated Royal Navy aviator of World War II, who suffered a concussion, yet managed to land an aircraft on an aircraft carrier. Uh, quite extraordinary. So we'll talk about that in a bit. Um, I'll just remind you of one. My father-in-law, uh, when we were down in Barbados one time on, on holidays, he had uh, several events that were transient ischemic attacks, um, but, but, but he also lost memory for, or at least he couldn't make any new memories for a period of several days. And, uh, and the lesion that was responsible for that was in the, was on the non-dominant, it was in the non-dominant uh, thalamus in the dorsal medial nucleus of the, of the thalamus which is well known to be associated with uh, an inability to uh, make 
uh, new memories. Uh, something you may not have heard about that uh, you may have, well, maybe you have, uh, may have experienced it, but transient global amnesia. It's a phenomenon that, that happens in, uh, well, if, from about the 50s on. It doesn't tend to occur, but it's, uh, but it's mystifying because no one actually knows what causes it at this point. But somebody would, like my father-in-law, lose the ability to um, uh, make any new memories. Uh, and it might go on for several hours. It might go on for a day, day and a half, and then it goes. And then it doesn't repeat. And people have wondered about, well, is that, uh, is that a little mini stroke? Well, it doesn't seem to be much evidence for that. Is it an epileptic phenomenon? Not that either. So then what is actually happening? But it doesn't seem to carry a bad prognosis. But it isn't just the memory impairment. These people are disoriented too for this period of time. And um, which brings me to the next one, epilepsy. Um, and the one that uh, gets my attention first is that first one on the, on the list, petty mall seizures. Now this is uh, probably the most, it is the most common form of epilepsy in kids. And uh, I don't know if you've ever seen it, but the, the, uh, the most common form is very, very brief. It might just last a few seconds. And you look at the kid and the eyelids are kind of flickering away. The kid has no memory for this. These are gaps in their consciousness and awareness that might last seconds, maybe as much as a minute or so. There might be a flicker of a, of a hand or, or a finger. But there's also some people, especially in adults, it's pretty uncommon. They develop petty mole status. If you look at the EEG, the electroencephalogram, it's striking because it's dominated by three per second spike in waves. I mean, it's very striking. The whole brain looks like that, at least the cerebrum. And, but some of these patients can go about their lives. They can drive cars. They can get on airplanes, travel from city to city, book into hotels. There have been a few celebrated cases like that, but the person has no memory for the period in which this has gone on. Now, are they really sharp during this period? Not, not really. And, I, and I've seen a couple of people like this, but, but it's amazing how well they can function. And then there's something that, that worries people in intensive care units. Um, people who have uh, severe encephalopathy, uh, per, perhaps after a cardiac arrest or after some major cardiac or heart surgery, uh, or severe brain trauma. And, and um, you know, not all seizures are associated with, with jerking or twitching of the limbs. And, and there is this phenomenon of non-convulsive status epilepticus. So it, unless you realize this, if you're consulting on patients in this situation, um, you might not recognize that you could actually treat that and, and stop it. Um, so, but that requires doing an electroencephalogram. But the point is that, that, that excessive electrical discharges, especially synchronized ones, highly synchronized ones, such as in status, uh, either the petty mall or the non-convulsive form of status epilepticus that we see in intensive care units, um, uh, that can alter whether the patient responds or not. So that's an important thing to know. Now here's this cartoon. This could have been my father's drawing on the right. There's the cat on, on, on the left, the, the whole cat. But, uh, but somebody with his right non-dominant hemisphere lesion, and that's their drawing of it. So they completely missed the left half of the cat. It looks like a knife stuck right down through the cat. You think about this when you go away, and think, gee, now what's actually happening here? Because the, because the wherewithal has reached from the left visual field has reached the right visual cortex, but it's not being registered, right? That's, 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 that's what's happened. So um, anyway, that's a, 
that was something. Now, um, there are a few others I want to bring up here, uh, and then we'll get down to the business of discussing some of them in, in detail. But, but the most severe forms of, of uh, uh, or causes of lack of consciousness in, in, in humans uh, is probably the most common is this ischemic hypoxic thing, meaning the circulation stopped for uh, too long a period of time and there was severe widespread ischemic hypoxic injury to, to the brain. The brain is very sensitive to, uh, to you, you know, it needs glucose as its source of energy. That's its primary source of energy. So when that drops, the oxygen level drops, no more oxidative phosphorylation, no energy, the brain dies. Uh, until we get to something I'm going to talk about later. Um, and then in the Iraq war, the first, uh, 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 no, I guess it was the second Iraq war, was the, the incidence of severe blast injuries, you know, bombs going off under military vehicles. And, um, and I know that the, I mean, that caused a lot of trouble for the youth. For the U.S. Uh, Marines and the and the Army on on the ground, and um, and some of those that's where the term post traumatic stress disorder came from, out of that Iraq War. So um, uh, anyway, we're going to talk about that a bit later. Now there is a phenomenon of kind of locked in syndrome, and um, Strictly speak, these are not these are people who are conscious, but you might not know it. And uh, one of them I mentioned there's this acute post-infectious inflammatory polyneuritis, a long word. It's the Guillain Barre uh, neuritis. It's it's an inflammatory one. Incidentally, it occurs after COVID, as well as uh, an encephalitis and strokes. Those are the three things that happen with COVID with respect to the brain. I had a patient one time and who had such a severe case of this, she couldn't move anything, couldn't move her eyes, couldn't move her limbs. So she couldn't let you know, couldn't let me know, couldn't let the staff know uh, whether she was picking up any, any, anything that they said to her. And when she recovered, and she recovered uh, remarkably well, I remember talking to her and I said, gee, what was it like during that period? I mean, you were fully aware. And she said it was really, uh, it was really hard because staff, well-meaning staff who are working on her, over her, rolling her, moving her, sometimes it was extraordinarily painful. She had no way of letting them know. And they would talk over her as if she didn't exist. And uh, so I asked her, I said, would you mind coming back? Because these cases aren't unusual. And I said, just to talk to the family and the staff, and she did. And it transformed the ICU unit uh, for a period of time. But the other thing, people with strokes that affect the, the, the ventral part of the pons, that can certainly cause complete paralysis of all four limbs and, uh, and some of the bulbar muscles, the facial and and, uh, and uh, jaw muscles and, and make it very difficult for people to make their, their thoughts or responses known. Uh, sleep deprivation is certainly uh, something that disorients people. One thing that I've been very, um, well, sad about, but, but uh, aware of is that, you know, some of you, uh, may know that my wife is in long-term care. And when COVID struck, every, I think almost everyone it, there had COVID because they turned positive. That plus the isolation, they were all kept in their rooms, the meals were delivered to the rooms. So they're really um, in isolation without a brain that can comprehend the isolation. It was totally disorienting. It was it was, uh, it was awful to, to watch. I mean, they really had no choice, but 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 it does show how disorienting 
uh, isolation can be uh, for people. So um, now at the bottom, I have meditation. David Elkins, who um, is going to speak on that in, the, in the, the seventh session. I'm really looking forward to that because there's a must be a lot of stuff going on there they're related to attention and consciousness. And there are probably a lot of dimensions to that. So I'm very much looking forward to David's talk on that. Now, back to this, um, to this uh, Eric Brown. Eric Brown was, as I said, one of the most celebrated, the most celebrated Royal Navy, if not the whole of the uh, Air Arm in the UK uh, pilot in World War II. And, um, and the story goes, uh, and it'll be in the late report this week, but the story goes that uh, he was serving on one of these escort carriers, which was really a, a Churchill decision. They lopped off the top of uh, some ships and put a bare deck on it, uh, you know, the length of 300 to 400 feet. Uh, I mean, that's, that's almost an impossible distance to take off in. And, um, and they, and they were flying these, these wildcats, Len Lease, from the UK, and uh, a formidable uh, fighting machine. But landing this thing, uh, taking off and landing this thing, um, is really demanding. And then you, if you can imagine landing at Pearson Airport to, to find it the, that, the, uh, that, uh, that the land is suddenly heaving up to you or falling away or tilting in one direction or another. Well, that's what happens on ships, uh, at least not modern day uh, large carriers, but in those small escort carriers, any kind of sea, and this was in the Bay of Biscay in, uh, in um, I think in December or January. Anyway, uh, they've uh, spotted a, a German reconnaissance airport, uh, airplane and and Eric Brown and, and his leader took off to intercept. They shot it down, but in the process, uh, there was return fire right into Brown's cockpit. He remembered nothing from there on in, right to within say 15 or 20 minutes after he landed. Now, you, if you know anything about flying, just imagine landing an aircraft it's already extraordinarily difficult under the best of conditions. And uh, his leader took off a position off his port wing and guided him down. And I looked up the, the, you know, the checklist for this aircraft. And there's a lot of stuff going on, pre-landing checks, a lot of stuff, uh, including winding a, a, uh, uh, something about 20 times to get the gear down. And, uh, and apparently it was his best landing ever. He had absolutely no recall. Of it. And yet he was able to process what he was told and maybe some of it uh, on, a, on his own. I, I, I don't know, but it's, it's an extraordinary thing that somebody can carry out such a complex task and have no recall. Um, now, that's, this is a picture from, uh, um, from the New England Journal of Medicine about uh, a friend of mine, anyway, wrote this article on concussion, Ellen Roper. And it's really just to illustrate the fact that uh, when we bump our head, and maybe this is what, almost certainly what happened with Eric Brown, happens in football regularly. Uh, and especially glancing blows are bad because they had spins and, uh, and there's nothing holding the brain right in place except uh, where the brain stem kind of goes in. But, but the rest of it is free to, to spin and move. And, and it becomes injured right in the frontal poles here and the anterior pole, the front pole of the temporal lobe. And, and if you look microscopically at the brain, you find that some of the longest nerve fibers are broken. They've been that torsional movement, that violent tor torsional movement has probably um, torn these, these nerve fibers. So um, now this book, Plum and Posner, this 
when I trained in, in neurology, one of the things I dreaded was getting a consult uh, in an intensive care unit or something like or the emergency room. Somebody was there, uh, suprus or in coma, and were behaving in some odd way. And, um, and none of my mentors were very good at assessing this kind of stuff. I think they were quite happy to send us off to do this. And the transformational change, Fred Plum was a neurologist in New York, and he just rewrote the book on the assessment of coma. And, um, and this one's a, the most recent one, it's the fifth edition. Uh, Fred died about uh, 18 years ago. But, um, but he developed a system, a systematic way of, of, of assessing these patients in, short, in a short period of time, that you could get quite a comprehensive assessment about the, probably the nature of the injury and certainly where it was by um, assessing the level of consciousness, by assessing movement or the capacity for movement, but especially all the brainstem functions and the respiratory function and the pupillary size and eye movement, because all of those things are heavily concentrated in the brainstem. So that, that was transformational for me. Um, and, and so here's some of that, not the evidence from Fred Plum, but in monkeys. This, this is a, a cut right down the middle here. This is the corpus callosum connecting the, the two hemispheres here. So this is right down the middle. Here's the brain stem, the upper part of the brain stem here, right, right down to the lower part of the brain stem here, the cerebellum at the back. Basically, the lesions that, that most often because on your phone or on your computer are lesions in the it's upper to log in, but it's not something like that's, you that's might not have a secure connection or you're being tracked. Phone. That's what it says. Oh, Some of them yeah. extend up so here like, oh, on the thalamus yeah. here on both sides, or it's so oh, severe okay. in both hemispheres yeah. to do it. But those, but that's where the lesions are. Lesions down here cause their own problems, but not lost or disturbed consciousness. So, and, uh, and so this is actually from Fred Plum's first edition. I actually prefer, believe it or not, the first and second editions. They have nice color pictures in the, in the most recent one, but I think the essential correlations are all, so the essential correlations were all in that stuff that Fred Plum uh, Posner worked out. So here are the lesions, extensive lesions, in both hemispheres here, or the involving the upper part of the brainstem in humans. Here, now, the reason why I put this picture in, because uh, you know we all have our heroes, and in clinical uh, neurology, and in this case, neurosurgery, uh, it included Charlie Drake, uh, who is an absolutely world-class neurosurgeon in London Health Sciences, believe it or not, and uh, in Ontario here. And, um, and, and Charlie earned his reputation uh, because he was, uh, well, he was a really, really good clinician and he was very good with people, but also from a technical surgical point of view, he was bold, but at the same time cautious and wary. And his reputation was earned on clipping aneurysms at the base of the brain. Now, what made those operations so dangerous was not the aneurysm, but the fine, little fine blood vessels that came off the basilar artery, that's the big artery at the base of the brain, that go right to the brain stem. And if, those, if he managed to include in the clip or somehow injure any of those little vessels, the patient was devastated and, and never recovered. And, uh, and, and they'd have lesions here, their midbrain or elsewhere, but it was a devastating thing. And he was singularly really very good at it. Um, so good for Charlie, and he was a great colleague to have. Um, that's Fred Plum of Plum and Posner. I might mention both men 
uh, developed uh, illnesses in the late part of their life that killed them in a, in, in a few months. Both of them made a decision that, that they didn't want anything done about it. And uh, in fact, Fred Plum was, was kind of there before Maid was there and uh, making the case for something like Maid in the United States. You didn't get very far, but uh, it's too early for that. But, uh, but, uh, but Fred's system really depended on, the asse on assessing the patient's behavior, how much did they move? Were they conscious? Did they respond at all uh, or not? Um, but also lesions in various parts of the brain affect the respiratory system. So lesions, for example, uh, high in the, the upper part of the, the brain stem and where it connects and the basal ganglia there are often associated with these uh, so-called chain Stokes respiration, the cyclical change that you kind of see here. And, um, and some of them in the high brain stem, they hyperventilate. And then you see these bizarre patterns. So even just as assessing their, their pattern of respiration, you have a pretty good idea where the lesion was. And just from assessing pupillary size and, and responsiveness and, and eye movements, just by turning the head from right to left, you have a pretty good idea because when you turn the head to the right, the eyes should still be looking straight ahead. And, or if you inject some cold water uh, into the ear, the caloric response, the eyes should both move to the side of the stimulation with cold water. But if you look here, maybe it's hard for you to see there, but this person's then, you know, they've injected some water in here and the eye on the side of the injection moves as it should to the left side, but the other eye doesn't move over along with it. That tells you that lesion is right in the upper brainstem. It's very specific clinical information that you can get from a clinical assessment. And if you stimulate the orbit just by you know, pressing hard on the orbit sufficient to make it uncomfortable, some patients will stiffen out straight legs and arms, so-called decerebrate uh, posturing. And that also tells you where the lesion is. It's in the brainstem and it's in the above the pons. So uh, I'm just showing you that and I won't go through that, but I, um, I'm just making the case that, that, there, that from a clinical perspective, the correlation, the physiological and anatomical correlation between uh, uh, conscious awareness and and, and the lesion, and even the likely cause, can be gathered with very few pieces of information, but they have to be collected well. Now, we're going to talk about brain death because this is uh, because of the whole transplantation business. This has become a big issue, and it's an uncomfortable issue, it was for me in Boston, because again, I'd be asked to see some of these patients in consultation. And, uh, and then around the rim was the transplant team. Essentially, they wanted to know, is this patient meet the criteria for brain death? And therefore, can we harvest the organ? I mean, it's a very uncomfortable position to be in. Here are the basic criteria. There's more to it than this, but these are the basic criteria. But there has to be some logical reason for the purported severity of, of the injury based on the history. Was, was it a car accident, uh, a gunshot wound? Something obvious like that, that's, that, that's understandable or, or a large aneurysm that's ruptured or a large uh, ischemic stroke or several of them. Something that's obvious that you can uh, get a pretty good, good idea from the clinical examination, but with uh, imaging these days, you have a plausible, sensible reason for this person's unconsciousness. And then you have to be really sure that there isn't something else there contributing to it. And sedatives, intoxications. Uh, I can think of one member of our community here about 10 years ago who uh, developed an acute 
uh, septicemia and was uh, unconscious within hours and unresponsive. And, um, and it was because of a severe septicemia. And, uh, and, and uh, he made a, a great recovery, but it took about uh, two weeks to do it. Um, and the, that gets to the third point there. You've waited long enough to allow for any reasonable possibility for recovery to take place. And then the last criteria is you have to show that the brain stem is incapable of triggering breathing, even when the patient's oxygenated, oxygenated properly. So that, those are the criteria. Now, we've added some other things, which I'm going to show you here, uh, because one of the concerns here is that uh, almost all of these assessments of awareness consciousness depend on some, at least in the clinical world, on some response, some meaningful response from the patient. But if the patient can't respond for some reason, how do you know? Are they processing the information and you just don't know about it? Um, that's clearly a possibility. And, um, and then there was a paper that came out in uh, 2010 that turned the world upside down, at least the world of brain death upside down, because um, a, a group at Cambridge in England and one in the Netherlands working together um, did a very interesting study of, people, uh, of uh, patients with severe brain injuries. Uh, most of them were, were um, uh, severe trauma lesions, the kind of thing that would happen in a car accident, um, or they were uh, major ischemic strokes. That would probably make up 80% of those cases. And they used functional MRI, which is a way of assessing kind of brain activity. I'm sure David Elkins will say a lot more about this, but it's related to oxygen consumption and, and local blood flow changes in relation to some form of stimulus or brain activity. And that's what they did with, uh, with interesting response. I'll, I'll go ahead here because here's the, here's the data right here, because this is the control. All these others down right here are patients, but this one's a control. And, 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 and they asked these people to, um, or they would say to them, now these are patients who are clinically un responsive, not responding to, to anything, no, no obvious response in any way, not a flickering of the eyelids, not any movement of the eyes, nothing to suggest that they were kind of clued in. And then he would ask, or they would ask them as part of the protocol to imagine walking through your home, something familiar, imagine walking through your home or imagine a familiar landscape, a neighborhood. And um, the, the, the stunner uh, is, if you look at all of these patients, there's the five here, now there, there's, there's the control, Never mind the specific area. The same area is lighting up in all five patients with with, with severe brain injuries. And, and look at how severe they are. Have a look at that, what a normal brain looks like here on this sagittal section right down the middle here. And uh, well, let's just uh, look over, look at, uh, at here. Well, over here, this, this patient. Look at the enormous ventricles here. In fact, one whole hemisphere has literally been gutted. It's just all filled with fluid. And even, the, and even on the other side. So there's been a lot of very extensive brain damage here. You compare the size of the brain stem here is what it is there, probably about half the size. And the cerebellum, which has a nice normal size here, uh, is probably a quarter of that. So this has been a widespread, severe change, yet this patient seems to, there, there's some evidence that a vocal signal with some content to it is getting through and the appropriate 
and appropriate area of the brain lit up. Um, and, uh, and it's true if you look at these other cases too, because they all have evidence of pretty severe brain injuries. Um, here's one right down here. Look at, look at the, just compare this, the third ventricle here. I mean, it's huge and the lateral ventricles here. So there was a huge, and, and even adjacent to the area that lit up. I mean, here are gyri in here that are, that are really atrophic. So these are no doubt about it, just on the imaging alone, these are severe brain injuries. Yet, uh, these patients are pro that processing some information. Now the question is, is was this meaningful? Um, and um, there are ways of teasing this out, but, but it's, it, it's not easy. Trust me, it, 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 it's very difficult. So, um, and then the other way, I mean, functional MRI machines are not the most portable things to have in intensive care units. A lot easier is just to do, they, they do electroencephalograms all the time. Just leave the electrodes on and record day after day after day. And, uh, but it's very difficult to make sense out of an EEG that way. And, um, and so they tied it with artificial intelligence uh, with an algorithm that, that, that allowed it to learn. That's, that's the important thing. And, and they got equivalent information to what they got with the functional MRI, meaning some patients, not, we're not talking many, we're talking about five or 10% of these patients. But nonetheless, they seem to be uh, processing information where, um, where physicians who were looking after them uh, weren't aware of it. Now, this long list of, I don't expect anyone to read this, but, um, but there was an extraordinary thing that happened in the, the journal Nature back in 2019, and an extraordinary experiment was done. You know, in stroke, one of the questions has been, um, uh, you know, uh, 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 the longer an area isn't perfused, uh, the greater the chance it's going to die. And, and that time might be three minutes, uh, five minutes, uh, might be longer depending on collateral flow, but, uh, but then the criteria were, gee, well, we have to get rid of the clot within three hours, then it was moved to six hours, then sometimes a little later. So this group decided to have a look at it, this is John Hopkins. And, they, and so they went to a slaughterhouse and they took, you know, they, can sever, they sever the head off the, off the pig and then reestablished the circulation to the brain using an artificial perfusate, and they dialyze the thing. So in a sense, the, the brain's all been re-plumbed within four hours. The staggering thing is that after four hours of a complete loss of any circulation, that cells that were starting to swell, oxidative phosphorylation is shut down, it's recovering. Shells are, cells are shrinking. They start to generate action potentials and electrical activity. They even generate rhythmic EEG activity. So are these brains sentient? Is there any awareness? Do they have any awareness? You can see where the, where the crux comes in to some of this stuff. So, um, so this it's a series of papers. There are more papers written by ethicists in this issue than there were the people doing the study. Um, and, uh, and the people who did the study did it very cautiously. They were very careful. It's a well done study. I don't think anyone's about to repeat it, but it is sure a lesson that the brain can last a lot longer than we thought. And, uh, and uh, I think that that was really quite remarkable. Now we move on to another big step forward 
in the brain and um, and we'll maybe call it a day after this but this whole business of um, uh, you probably or may know that you can take uh, cells from the skin of you or I, any of us, and program them rather simply. It doesn't take much. And they can revert to stem cell status. And then with a few other molecular signals, you can redirect them to become the progenitors of nerve cells. And left to their devices, they will grow into a 100 cell, 1,000 cell, 10,000 cell, 100,000 cell, million cell, little brain organoid that looks like a bit of neocortex, like the human neocortex. There's no blood supply, it doesn't need it, such a small piece that it's enough diffusion of oxygen in to kind of keep it going. So there's the size. Look at these, carrying around the 16 of these little, or, or uh, four, uh, six of them in here. There's look at these little, little brains here. You say, why would anyone do anything as ridiculous as that? Well, we don't understand a lot of the uh, really important molecular cues and genetic directions very early in development. And yet that's probably where things like schizophrenia are developing. And, um, and as I'm going to show you, it's an interesting way, the only way that we have of seeing, well, gee, uh, did Neanderthal brains differ from ours? Well, we know that the shape of the skull did, and therefore the shape of the brain. And we have some maybe evidence of behavioral distinctions, but a lot less than we thought. Um, so can you introduce, as we're going to show in a few moments, Neanderthal genes into this human mini brain about to develop. So it's now being directed or misdirected, as the case may be, by a Neanderthal gene. So let's, uh, let's look at that. This is what these organoids look like. They're, they're, you can tag a fluorescent compounds onto these. So individual cells light up and, and they're processing. So it, you know, there really is much information in that, but you could see how well they could do it. If you take different genes, every color, every different color here is a different gene being expressed in diff by different cells. This is an early stage in the development. There are already hundreds of cells here in this, in this organoid. And, and it will develop into a layered cortex that looks like our neocortex. The big difference is it doesn't have any sensory input to it, and it doesn't have any distant connections, obviously. Um, this whole business of mapping genes spatially and temporally has ju just made a huge advance recently, because now it's possible in a single cell to track hundreds of genes as they multiply and take up different stations in a developing brain. That's precisely the kind of blueprint that we really need when it comes to the brain. So, um, so here's the, uh, well, I won't, I've already said all of this, but, but, but essentially have taken a, a human, have taken these human stem cells, uh, modified them using CRISPR, so that they uh, so that they have one uh, one in this this no, noba uh, noba yeah in a in, in a in a in OBA one gene and it's the Neanderthal version so using uh, CRISPR they've edited this uh, what's going to be this mini brain and then um, and what did they find what was the impact of this well um, quite a lot because it affected the expression of a whole lot of other genes. And it changed synapses and it changed connection. So just introducing one gene from a Neanderthal changed the development of these organoids. 
I'm sure there's a lot more coming. And this is a look at, uh, these are normal, uh, if you could speak of these organoids as normal, but these are, these would be normal uh, human organoids here. This is the one where the gene's been spliced in from a, from a Neanderthal, and they certainly look different. Uh, there's no way of knowing whether they're behaviorally different, but, but uh, anyway, I thought that was an interesting thing, but of course it brings up this whole business and uh, where did this come from? Some magazine, I picked it up, but uh, this whole question of are these pig brains, are these mini brains, do they have some consciousness? Actually, after all, you're growing life. And, and life that looks a lot like, in the case of these mini brains, a lot like us, a very small part of us. And, and interestingly enough, both the pig brains and these mini brains develop rhythmic electroencephalographic activity that's very much like a premature baby. And uh, so, and then I was really quite startled the other day because now, I mean, the technology, the pace here is, is just, it's blistering. This is a blastocyst. This is a uh, hundred cells later than, than uh, fertilization. And, uh, and, and this provide, this is kind of a mini brain version of that in which they can study, you know, one cell to two cells to four cells, eight cells, 16, 32, all the way up this kind of exponential growth. And all along the way, this is magnificent biological choreography, like no dance choreography has ever been. There are so many players here, so many complex players in, in, this, in this too, and it all plays out remarkably similarly in even closely related species uh, or more distantly related species. So, um, so there it is, the blastocyst. And uh, there's a section of the a cross section, coronal section of a mouse brain. There is the ventricles, it looks, there's their cortex out here. And, um, and tracking this, these methods, these hundreds, if not thousands of genes <clears throat> and their spatial location. So I thought, boy, what, a, what an interesting thing. So now we're coming up just a couple of minutes here. Um, this, this question, uh, the broader stuff of consciousness, I thought I was going to cover more, I mean, from a philosophical point of view, I thought I'd get into it this week. I'm not going to get into it far, but it's interesting that the Star Trek series, you know, they, they consulted with biologists and, and, um, and physicists like Stephen uh, uh, Hawking, so they were very aware of some of the ethical, moral issues, and 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 they they were talking to good people, and they had one particular, you know, I don't know whether you're aware of it, but one of the crew data was a silicon based thing. He was, uh, uh, and but with the intelligence. Uh, of, of a human, just not the same emotional responses. And so they, they set up a, a, uh, a jury because some people from Starfleet thought, gee, this is a great opportunity to uh, take data apart, figure out how he was made, and we could make more of them. And then, uh, but uh, uh, Captain Picard said, no, um, we, this is, Data is, is a sentient person and entitled to all of the rights of every other crew member here. And so they had this court case about it. But, but it's interesting, I mean, that was in 1983. So there we are uh, 30, 35 years plus years ago. And um, those are the kinds of issues that came up. That's why there were three ethical papers on the pig brain stuff, because people were were sensitive. They were they were already talking about this kind of thing. So um, and um, so I'm going to ha have to 
not we already discussed last week the faith healing business, the Zamboni stuff, uh, the biblical, but other uh, uh, religious traditions, healings and actions, and uh, and we talked a little bit about near death experience. I've got a, I've had a lot of feedback on the last, um, but I would just say one 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 interesting observation, quite aside from. Uh, the, the one that was, remember I mentioned last week where we stim, where they stimulated the, uh, the posterior temporal lower parietal region and induced an out of body experience. But sometimes, for example, it doesn't happen often, but people do fall um, who climb mountains and they actually survive. And one of the common things that they report after and if you can't imagine this time lasted very long before they hit, uh, maybe a minute, if that. Um, they report their whole life played out for them in this extraordinarily short period of time. It's kind of a, a sense of time dilation. And I had an experience of myself, which we'll maybe talk about at some time about this. So these, these, um, these uh, uh, mental changes that take place are, they're, they're certainly very real. Um, I haven't a clue what, uh, about what the underlying physiological basis is, but they're certainly very real. So I think it's maybe time for, for, for questions. I'm uh, sorry we didn't get, Oh, there we are. There's no shortage of books. By the way, when I mentioned that out of uh, out of body experiences, this is the one that really struck me the most. Uh, he's a neurosurgeon, and he was unconscious for seven or eight days, I think, with some form of encephalitis, meningitis, and and then described this most elaborate story after. I mean, if heaven is anything like what he described, we should all be going there. Uh, and, uh, and it's really quite amazing. Um, so, um, uh, I think we're, I don't know. Uh, uh, can you, do any of you have questions? I think you're, uh, I think you're all open. Yeah. If anyone Again? has a question, can you see me? <laughs> oh, oh, okay. Oh, oh, I, oh, yeah, you're controlling. You from Hang the on, there right. I am. All right, there we are. It says wake up under you. Okay, there we go. Yeah, Anybody have a question are. that they would like to ask? Yeah. Any, Just unmute answered. yourself and go for it. Yeah. Any thoughts? Uh, yes. I think Mr. D'Souza, do you have a question? Uh, you'll have to unmute yourself, sir. Uh, there you go. Dr. Brown, could you please uh, explain the dreams in terms of the brain function? How do we remember the dreams and what we learn from it? Oh, uh, wonderful question. Um, I'll, uh, I forgot to mention this in the, uh, in the presentation here, but CREB, a CREB cycle, got a Nobel Prize for or, uh, or describing uh, the uh, Krem cycle <laughs> after his name. And, but he describes a very interesting thing. He, he, he was stalled out. And it, it, it just... And uh, one, one time he, uh, he went to sleep, exhausted, and he woke up. And um, he had the answer. And it crossed his mind, my heavens, I gotta write this down. But he didn't. And when he woke up the next morning, all gone. He would it happened, that <laughs> he missed an opportunity. And then several weeks later, he had another dream. And it was the same, same illumination on his work. That time he got up and he wrote it all down. And it was in fact the breakthrough uh, for him. 
Now, uh, it, it, I don't think that's an extraordinary experience, but I mean, that's kind of one form of dream. Dreaming is, uh, is a lot more uh, common than we're aware of because from an electroencephalographic point of view, the brainwave activity that corresponds to dreaming um, occupies maybe what a third of our third of our sleep, depending on our age. And uh, so a lot's going on. I think the brain's doing a lot of stuff off. I, I was going to say offline. It's very much online, but below the threshold of our awareness and consciousness. I mean, sure. I mean, I'm looking at a pretty uh, competent group of people here, and. So all of you must have had experience of wrestling with something and then an answer coming to you. You have that kind of gestalt. All of a sudden you've been working at it and you don't, you don't know where, where it came from. And that was certainly uh, true with Watson, of Watson and Crick at the DNA. They kind of, all of a sudden he got them and uh, figured out how that double helix was actually put together. But but uh, dreams are, I think it's a very productive period. The other thing is sleep is a very active time in, in the brain. Uh, and, this, and never more so than with, with, uh, with REM sleep. And, and, um, and it's also a time when the garbage is taken out in the system because normally nerve cells are very closely applied to one another. There's very little room to get the garbage out. And what happens in sleep is the cells kind of pull apart a little bit. And uh, you could actually get some circulation going. So uh, the, the, the garbage, uh, so that's one of the things people have wondered about what's happening with Alzheimer's disease. That because of the quality of sleep was poor, they didn't have enough time to get rid of their protein garbage, uh, meaning tau and, and uh, amyloid. I don't know what to make of that, but um, I'm sure I haven't answered your question. Anything else? No? Yes. Yes. Um, looking, down the, looking down the road to the future, um, what about the possibility of brain transplants? Oh, um, uh, I think that's... Uh, well, I think in a vestigial form, that's happening already, isn't it? Because, mm -hmm. because for at least 10 years or more, um, people have been implanting silicone uh, 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 implants into, into, the, into the brain, little mini computers sometimes, or just an array of electrodes. Uh, but... Um, uh, it's, it's <laughs> one slide I left out here was one of those organoids actually running a machine beside it. So there was the machine. This was in science. So there's this little machine. I've forgotten what it was doing, but it didn't do it unless it was connected to this little mini brain. So I'm not quite sure what was going on, but, uh, uh, but I, uh, it will. Uh, the problem is that you know the. Um, I when when I look at all the stuff that's being done. To restore movement. Uh, to people who are paralyzed, it's surprising how much success they have, with a system that's as crude as it is. I mean, in that, I showed you a slide earlier, I think it was session two or something like that, of a patient with Lou Gehrig's disease you know, who is paralyzed in all four limbs. And there was an electrode sitting over the surface of the brain. There were four electrode surfaces, only four. Probably each of those surface, each of those uh, kind of three or four millimeter discs were probably covering hundreds, if not thousands of underlying nerve cells. So it's listening to a huge orchestra of activity. 
uh, how do you make sense out of that? Well, they used AI to, to get some sense out of it. And, um, and they did restore some useful, I mean, it took them six months of training, the person and, and the team. Uh, but I think it's very early in the game. Sometimes they have these spectacular, uh, some would say successes. I, I think of them as PR things where um, a brain in uh, New Orleans is controlling the legs of a, of a monkey in Tokyo. Uh, so uh, I don't think that's very useful, but I, but I think where we would like to see it, at least I would like to see it, I'd like to see some cognitive enhancement. Uh, mm -hmm. But mind you, uh, it, the game has changed, says that we don't have to, um, the premium, there isn't as much premium on memory now because we could so easily Google it. We can, we can get access to all kinds of information online that it would take a huge library to access. And uh, so, um, I don't know, uh, a couple of people in the audience here probably answer better than I could. But um, Peter Cast, one of them, is hiding at the top there. But um, anyway, did you hear that, Peter? OK, so uh, <laughs> he's waving. Yeah, yeah, because Peter's been very generous with me in sending uh, stuff from the IEEE about um, uh, especially anything to do with AI. And uh, Peter's an electrical engineer. So um, anyway, uh, any other thoughts about the morality, the ethics? No, no questions about that? Well, just, that's a big field. Um, okay. Just as an aside, there's a French movie from a few years ago called The Bell Jar and yeah. the Butterfly about locked-in syndrome. Yes. It's a very good film. That's all. Yeah. Do you remember what the what the patient had, David? Locked in syndrome. No, I. That's the syndrome. But you remember from, what the from, cause of it was? That uh, was caused by a traffic accident. Oh, a traffic accident. Okay, yeah, but yeah. Um, yeah, but that patient of mine with GBS was totally par All she had, all she, all she could do was make tears. The only thing the chap. It's a true story. He was a fashion designer. He could move one eyelid. And uh, a nurse who was very patient actually started communicating to him, and he wrote the book using one eyelid to spell. She would go through letters and so on, and, and he would flick his eyelid at an appropriate time, and he produced the book. It's very Stephen Hawking, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, like uh, an anyway, anyway, interesting comment. Uh, one of uh, Hawking's last graduate students commented on on the when he initially went to work with him, he was frustrated because it took so long to get anything out of Hawking, and literally letter by letter. And then he realized, as time went by, that he was actually getting a lot more out of it because he had a chance to think about it. And Hawking was, a, uh, was economical in his thinking and, and chose his words carefully and it gave him a chance to reflect in real time what was going on. So it wasn't, uh, it was actually, he thought of it as an advantage. But his point is we talked too, too quickly with too little. Fascinating. Better. Yeah. So anything else? Okay. Well, um, now next week uh, is there, there are two to go. Uh, and as I mentioned earlier, um, uh, David Elkins is doing the, the last one and uh, the seventh one on meditation. Um, and I'm sure a, a whole lot will come up that time, but uh, one of the things I want to, to deal with, I hope to get to today and didn't, is this threshold, this whole threshold system. When did humans 
reach this point, uh, and it's not obviously a singular point in time or, or space, but there obviously was some threshold when the brain uh, required the requisite uh, uh, imagination and, uh, and creativity um, and, and, and self-awareness and awareness of others um, to create um, uh, you know, the first stories, the first creation stories. What, what was that impulse all about? What, what's art all about? When, when did that happen? You know, th these things, as far as the archaeological record goes, are quite recent. We're talking, uh, say, 100, 150,000 years ago. It sounds long. It's not long in the evolutionary record. And uh, before that, none. Uh, and, and to the best of our record. Now, Maybe somebody will dig something up in, uh, in East Africa or something like that, 200,000 years earlier than that. But it's still a modest movement back. And uh, so I'm, I'm really very, very interested in that. What, what spurred that on? And, and, and does that play any role in our lives these days? And I'm certain it does, because I, I think those, uh, those characteristics that I've mentioned before, that this, uh, this propensity to tell and enjoy stories and to create uh, images uh, in various forms that reflect those, those stories and understanding um, is relatively recent and it's universal. It's a, one of those cultural universals of humanity. And uh, so I think that's well worth exploring. We won't have enough time to cover it, but but uh, Jane de Munich has been very helpful to me on this, and, and, uh, and, uh, which I appreciate. And, uh, and David and I have had conversations at other times too. So, um, so it's, a, it's a really big one uh, coming next week. I can't promise I'll be up to the job, but I'm certainly willing to try. And uh, so uh, we will see you next week. Thanks very much. See you, everybody. Have a good good afternoon. Thanks, Debbie. Thank you, Bill. Okay. Thank you. By the way, is anyone still connected? Yes. Okay. Is anyone have any of you read that proof of heaven? No. no. Um, it's a very interestingly bridge book. The guy is a, with a talented, is a talented neurosurgeon. He understands all of that stuff. But at the same time, something really remarkable happened. And uh, yeah, I yeah. am. So, uh, so I, I, I've read it and I've went, you know, I've had a terrible time this last week finding important books. Um, and uh, that's probably because my place looked like a mess. And that was one of the books I was looking for. Or the other common phenomenon is loaning books or borrowing books. Of course, they never end up sourced when you, when you want. Them. So anyway, um, the other books I haven't, I haven't read. And, and when I went online, those four are just the, the edge of a whole pile of things. Going on, um, it, it's a really interesting, and it, and uh, and the business. I mean, it's interesting that in science, the group that seems to be most interested in all of this are the physicists. Isn't that isn't that a little boggling? I find it a little boggling. But on the other hand, if you think about it, I spent a lifetime working with. There are no experimental. Uh, um, there's nothing like uh, theoretical physicists in medicine or in neuroscience. There, there's nothing like that. There is a bit in neuropsychology, meaning people who are developing new information, they're using information that's already there like Einstein did. They didn't create any more information. 
you just reimagine how it was tied together. And that's a unique thing about physicists. You know, there are probably a half of them are theoretical physicists. There's just no equivalent. All those Nobel Prizes I listed in there in medicine, they're all practical uh, exper experimentalists. They are the Rutherfords of, of neuroscience. There are no Einsteins in, in, in medicine or, or neuroscience. No one thinks that way. Um, and, and yet those are, the, those are the people who are so creative. Um, and uh, so, so it'll, it'll be um, at, uh, thank goodness uh, for the physics series. So uh, goodbye and we'll see you next week. Oh.